All right, everybody. I've got way too many slides for 20 minutes, so we're going to blaze through this really quickly. Um, but I'm going to be um, talking about the impacts of climate change on pediatric health. I'll make sure that you all get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. The way that I love to prepare my PowerPoints is to include the citations for um, different slides as part of the slides themselves. Um, so you all get a copy of this so you can go through it a little bit more intricately and read about some of the articles and studies that I have in here. Um, so I'm Dr. Kyle Denson Martin. I'm from Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island actually is one of the states that's been most affected by uh, global warming. Um, we have seen the most temperature rise over the course of the past decade. We've actually already hit two degrees <laughs> um, Celsius, um, and we're also very uh, susceptible to rising ocean levels, um, which has led to increases um, in flood security. So I'm, I'm sure here in New Orleans you have FEMA-associated um, flood insurance that you have to buy if you want to own a home, and that can really change your ability to buy a home or not, is whether you can afford that um, insurance. And in Rhode Island, we have that same sort of um, scenario if you live in certain coastal areas. But let's talk about kids. So um, I just have two main takeaway points, and one of them is understand how climate change affects kids. But I also want to talk about some potential interventions that we can have um, for helping to minimize um, and remedy some of the effects of climate change on pediatric health. I feel like a lot of times we are like focused on the circle of sadness. Um, and I feel like we should have like a climate change and health bingo. Um, and Every time you see this, it, or maybe it's like a, every time you see this, take a shot type of thing. Um, like when we go to our climate change and health conference. Because um, this is like, like Hannah was saying, like you can't get through a climate change and health lecture without seeing this sort of thing. And it, it is the circle of sadness. It just shows how our uh, world is gradually falling apart. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, the Netflix movie Don't Look Up. Um, but. Um, I think that it's a good representation of how the world reacts to the climate crisis, um, where like we're literally staring at the end of human civilization, but everyone's kind of joking about it um, and pretending that it doesn't exist. Um, I also like don't look up because I went to Michigan State and they make fun of the fact that the researchers who just discovered the comet that's going to destroy the world are from Michigan State. <laughs> They're like, can we get our guys to research this? Um, so according to the World Health Organization, 88% um, of the global burden of disease attributable, attributable to climate change um, occur in children under five years old. So children are facing the blunt of um, health-related effects of climate change. And we talked about this in our group. Um, you know, younger populations and older populations tend to be the most sensitive to any sort of um, emergency situation. Um, I know in my EDs, um, that I work in, uh, we are seeing like a massive geriatric population. You don't really see as many people who are in like the 20 to 60 year old age frame. We see people who are young and old. Um, and those are the people who are most susceptible to just emergencies in general, um, but also to climate change. Uh -oh. It keeps asking me to join the internet. Um, I love this. This is from an article at the end that I'll talk about, uh, a review article on climate change um, and pediatric health. Um, this is a, a nice illustration of how um, climate change and the various associated um, downstream effects lead to child health related um, changes. Um, and this highlights that children, this is because children lack the ability to buffer against environmental threats. Um, one, because they are taken care of by others. And then two, because they have different physiologic changes um, that cause them to be more vulnerable, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the, one, now we're just going to go through the various um, health effects. Um, one of the things is worsening seasonal allergies. So as we see increases in global temperatures, we see increased growing seasons for certain pollen-producing plants. And as those growing seasons uh, increase, the amount of pollen increases. Um, and this graph here um, on the right, from your perspective, is showing orange is the amount of global atmospheric CO2 
Um, and then the blue line is the amount of pollen production per plant. So you can see that the amount of pollen that's being produced is going up in a, a linear sort of trend as the amount of carbon dioxide is going up. So you, you might think your seasonal allergies are getting worse, and that's because they are. Um, and the seasons for allergies are being extended. So this second graph is showing the change in length of typical allergy seasons. So um, Caitlin over in Wisconsin, you know, you can see plus 15 days. That's an added two weeks of time um, to the allergy season um, as these as um, global temperatures are changing. And you look up in Canada, and you're seeing areas where you're getting three weeks added to the typical seasonal allergy season. And why does that affect kids? Well. Um, worsening seasonal allergies with kids. These are just a couple of citations, um, particularly related to the pollen seasons. Um, kids are more susceptible to asthma exacerbations. And as your seasonal allergies flare, you can have more um, allergy-associated asthma exacerbations and bronchospasm. Um, children are also more susceptible to air pollution-related flares of asthma. Um, so asthma is another problem that as we see changes in increasing temperatures, we start to see um, increased emergencies related to children. We talked about this in our, our small group a little bit earlier. You might think that the wildfires and their effects are um, constrained only to the west coast of the United States, but actually um, last year I was seeing a large number of pediatric patients in particular particular with asthma flares from wildfire smoke from California. So what this, what this image is showing is how the smoke from the wildfires, particularly um, black carbon in the air, spread according to the jet stream. So it spreads from California actually up into Canada, down through the Midwest and over into New England. And that causes a spread of um, these high particulate um, molecules that are actually um, in one study shown to be 10 times more potent at causing um, airway aggravation and asthma, asthma flares. They also cause COPD flares in older individuals, but wildfire smoke 10 times more potent in terms of causing airway irritation, especially in pediatric populations. Um, now kind of moving on, um, we talked about extreme weather earlier. This this is an illustration of um, how extreme weather has changed over the course of the past um, 40 years. Um, and what we're seeing is earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, they're pretty much staying the same. And that's just like Earth-related emergencies, like um, things that humans don't really have the ability to affect as much. But then you start to see the things that humans do have the ability to affect. Um, and with global warming, which are the meteorologic events like tropical storms um, and flooding mass movements, um, along with droughts and wildfires. And you start to see that, uh, especially with meteorologic events like tropical storms, flooding, and mass, mass movements associated with them, they're, they're dramatically increasing, particularly over the course of the past 20 years. Um, and how does that affect children? Well, children are dependent populations. So children, um, when children are displaced, they need somebody to guide them to a new location. Um, if that, it, and they can't take care of themselves, um, which means that when they're faced and with these sorts of situations and displaced, um, they're, they're more vulnerable to associated emergency conditions. Uh, this is the lime, yeah, take a drink. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I live in New England, um, and we see tick-borne illnesses for a good portion of the year. Um, but um, we have seen dramatic changes throughout the state of Rhode Island, but also through New England, as we've seen changes in, um, changes in temperature and we've also seen changes in land use, which are a consequence of those changes in temperature. So everything's kind of connected. Um, as people are being forced to move from other areas to new areas, they start um, establishing new housing neighborhoods in areas of wetlands um, or um, creating new 
um, communities that facilitate the spreading of different disease vectors that allow for the propagation of things like Lyme disease. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about earlier is also like Chagas disease. So Chagas disease um, is spreading upwards from where it was um, more typically found in South America through Central America and into the southwestern United States. Well, the thing about Chagas disease is it often doesn't present with any sort of acute illness until it's been around for about 20 or so years. Um, so if you don't know to look for Chagas disease, you're not gonna find Chagas disease until it's too late, until your patient's dying from a ruptured left ventricle um, or has some sort of esophageal dysmotility or some sort of um, you know, gut-related issue. Um, so it's important to just be familiar with climate change and its effects on the different vector-borne illnesses so that you can recognize them in your ED. I always tell the story of how I, when I lived in Michigan, I never ordered tick panels. Then I came to Rhode Island, and I'm ordering a tick panel for six to nine months out of the year. But pediatric populations are um, particularly vulnerable to these sorts of problems as well. Really wants me to join the internet. Um, we talked about this a little bit um, earlier, air pollution and its effects on uh, maternal populations, but also on pediatric populations. Um, Small particulate matter like PM 2.5 has been shown to um, lead to increased rates of um, preterm labor, um, but also lower birth weights for children. Um, and there have been several studies that have come out over the course of the last several years that have shown that it can actually lead to female infertility. So there was a study that came out of Denmark this year that was looking at this exact issue and found that your exposure to this particulate matter can lead to issue, increased issues with becoming pregnant. So um, again, air pollution has all of these downstream effects that we initially might not have even thought about, but now are starting to recognize. And the problem with pediatric exposures is that those exposures are cumulative. So they build up over the course of a child's life Impaired brain development, again, we're talking about this fine particulate matter, this PM 2.5. Um, several studies have shown that children who are in um, urban areas with a lot of road traffic um, tend to have decreased cognitive performance when, prepared, when compared to children who grow up in areas that have less road traffic and less air pollution exposure. Um, there, all of these studies have looked at this exact issue, actually, and they've consistently found that children um, have cognitive impairment based on the amount of pollution that they're exposed to. So pollution is not just bad for the lungs, it's bad for the brain. It's, it's bad for the body in general. So how do we solve the problem? Um, I love trees. I just gave a whole lecture on trees to the medical students at Brown. I just like nerded out on trees. Trees are amazing. Um, you know, they're not the total solution to the problem, but I think that trees are a definite solution to urban problems related to climate change and health. Um, and they can help to prevent ED visits. Um, so I love this picture. I, tr I stole it from Tree Pennsylvania, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for trees. But it, it summarizes like the various ways that trees are amazing. And I'll talk a little bit more about the pediatric reasons why trees are amazing in a second. Um, but you know, trees can help to reduce skin cancer. So the shade from trees um, in particular is good at helping to block some of the UV-related light. Um, it may not be completely effective at blocking all types of UV light, um, but it blocks some of, the, some of the different varieties of UV light and can help to prevent skin cancer. Um, trees absorb carbon dioxide, um, which helps to reduce the carbon dioxide that's in the general air that we breathe. Um, trees help to filter the air. People, there have been multiple studies that show that the more green space that is around, people tend to have a better quality of life with decreased anxiety. Um, studies that have looked at um, professionals with burnout have shown that if they participate in forest bathing, which is essentially just like hiking for an hour, several days a week, tend to have recovery of their burnout in several months, uh, which is actually really awesome. All you need to do to hike, like feel better about life is just hike a little bit. So, um, you know, Japan has done a lot of those studies. Japan knows where it's at when it comes to <laughs> like work-life balance. Um, 
And then trees promote healing. So there have been several studies that have shown that patients who have a window um, that faces the forest tend to heal better than patients who have a window that faces another building um, or urban landscape. So it sounds like such a silly thing, but even just like staring at trees makes your, your body happy. Our bodies love trees, um, just like I do. Um, so how does this relate to pediatric patients? Um, so longitudinally, um, the more green space that you have, the lower rates of lung cancer. Um, and this is from a Chinese study looking particularly at Shanghai. Um, lower prevalence of asthma among children. So if you grow up, so if you're born in an area that has a large prevalence of trees, you are less likely to have asthma. Um, what that means, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the more green space that you have, the less asthma is going to be present. But if you grow up in an area that has a lot of trees, you are less likely to have asthma as you get older. Um, and then areas that have a lot of trees have reduced asthma hospitalizations during high uh, ambient pollution. So as we see these um, hot, extreme hot weather days where we start to see more ambient pollution, areas that have more green space tend to have less asthma exacerbations amongst children. And then trees, uh, I don't know if you knew this, this is a fun fact, but tree shade reduces the um, ground surface temperature by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so urban, in urban spaces where it can get really hot, like New Orleans, um, if you're feeling very hot, go under a tree. It'll reduce it from 90 degrees to 80 degrees. But uh, I suppose then you get into the, like, the Phoenix versus New Orleans debate. Is it, is it dry heat or is it wet heat? And then you get really, I get people like me are like, what? Isn't it just like heat? Um, but anyways, um, you know, reduction, trees can help to reduce the ground surface level um, temperature, which can, which children are more susceptible to heat related emergencies because of their physiology. So they have a higher body surface area. So they have to work harder to cool themselves than um, people like you or I do. So, these are some fun illustrations. Trees reduce risk of heat stroke, and um, tree canopy covered. The more tree canopy cover you have, the lower um, number of heat-related ambulance calls during extreme heat events. Reductions in preterm birth. So this is why trees are great, right? So we just talked about how air pollution can increase risk of preterm birth and lower gestational weight. Well, as it turns out, if you have trees, they reverse that, <laughs> which is so cool. So trees are awesome, um, which if you think about the reasons why you end up with, so trees help to filter the air, they help to reduce the temperature, they improve mental health. So that's why they re reverse everything. So that's why trees are great. And then you get improved immune function. The more trees you have, the better your immune system works in terms of lower autoimmune diseases, but also a boosting in your natural killing cells. And join the internet. Um, all right, so a couple more things that we can do to help. Um, so air filtration. Um, this was kind of, as I was putting together this lecture, I was like, oh, shoot, I need to get some better air filters for my house. <laughs> I have a ton of kids, and I want them to be healthy. Um, this is like, and they all have like such cool little acronyms like MERV and HEPA and PICO and CATER. Um, so MERV, I've, I just recently like became more familiar with MERV as I was like working on my HVAC system at my house. Um, so this is the general rating system for most of the like air filters that you probably have in your house or apartment. Um, so those little like air filters that you put into your duct system. Um, and the magic number is 13. So you want to have uh, a rating of 13 or better um, to filter the air in your, as part of your HVAC system in your home. And w you can see a, as part of this graph, you know, once you get to 13, you're filtering these really small particles, 75 about 75% of those particles. At 12, you're only filtering like 20%. So 13 is kind of the magic number as you go down. And then once you get to 16, you really don't see much benefit in terms of filtration cap cap capability. Um, this graph here also shows the same sort of thing, but it shows in an illustrative form, kind of the different various sites of, types of um, molecules and um, 
animals that are being filtered out by your various types of um, filters that you have as part of your system. But the problem with these systems is they're not continuously running. So that's why you need to have um, some sort of other filter that works in smaller areas. And um, when we talk about this, we're talking about like HEPA filters. Some of you, I know in one of the EDs that I work in, a lot of the patient rooms even have their own individual HEPA filters. Um, so one of these individual machines that's there running the entire time. Um, and when we talk about HEPA filters, we're talking about a different rating system. So we're not talking about MERV, we're talking about CATER. And the way that you measure a CATER is based off of these three variables. So smoke, dust, and pollen. Um, so when you're, if you're looking for a HEPA filter, you want to look at those, and the higher the number, the better. So um, when you're comparing the different ones, the higher the numbers that they have for smoke, dust, and pollen, the better. And that basically, the higher the number says, this, this is better at filtering out these specific items. So this, this um, filter that I have as the example is really good. It filters out all these things. Uh, and, and CATER stands for Clean Air Delivery Rate. Um, and it's the, the ranking system for HEPA filters at this point that the EPA uses. Um, and they really have no better way of telling you which ones to buy at this point other than look for the ones with the highest number. Um, you might have also seen this thing called Molecule that's out there. It uses this thing called a Pico filter. Um, and the Pico filter uses a combination of um, like a physical filter, but also UV light in order to clean the air. Um, and there's been a lot of debate, um, particularly between the people that manufacture the molecule products and the HEPA filter people as to which one is better at this point in time. And I think a lot of research is coming out to try to determine which one might be better. I, I can't say at this point. Um, but it's something to look into, I think, in regards to filtering the air, especially when you learn about um, if you have small kids and you don't want them to be exposed to some of the downstream effects of small particle air, air pollution. Um, and then finally, renewable energy. I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on this again and again and again, but if we can reduce our dependence on carbon, we can reduce the production of CO2 that we have in the atmosphere. But also, you know, you can live off the grid and you can feel really cool about it. You know, it's like, I, I don't know, I live in a rural area of Rhode Island. Um, and I love like not being dependent on national grid because um, they're kind of terrible. Um, like, does anyone like their power company? Is there anyone out there who's like, oh yeah, I love my power company. They're fantastic. No, we all want to live off the grid. At least to a certain, we all want to have like some sort of backup and not be dependent on somebody else. So renewable energy allows us to get in that direction, but also allows us to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and this particulate matter that we have in the environment. And that's good for our kids. So there are a couple of review articles that will be included in this lecture when you get um, a chance to view it. One that I really like is this one that's in pediatrics that focuses on climate change and global child health. Um, and then the other one is this one here, which is from Nature, um, that cites a lot of the different topics and um, climate challenge uh, effects on pediatric populations. Um, so I would encourage you to read these two articles, this one from Pediatrics and this one from Nature, um, that are focused on this exact topic that I'm presenting today. And it, it'll help to kind of give you more references that you can go to um, and help to kind of flesh out this very brief introduction that I gave. Um, and I just wanted to plug this talk on Thursday morning. Um, you might recognize some of the faces that are going to be there, but we're going to talk even more about um, pediatric health and um, how climate change affects children. And then this is my, this is my flock of children. Um, like I said, I have a ton of kids. Um, and um, I have three and a half year old triplets and then a seven month old. Um, so this is my family at our house in New England. And that's it. <laughs>